Last week, we had an introduction to classical conditioning. And in this mini lecture, we'll talk more about some of the basics of classical conditioning. And we'll start by discussing the acquisition phase. And this is where your condition response is getting stronger because of repeated pairings of the NS and the US. So each time the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are paired, your condition response will get stronger and stronger and stronger up to a certain point. After that point, your condition response starts to level off and continued pairings of the NS and the US will not lead to stronger responding. So for example, if you have a fear of dogs because you were chased by a dog, the first time you're chased by a dog, so the first time the NS of the dog and the US of being chased are paired, you will have a low level of fear. So your condition response to fear will be at a low level. The next time you're chased, that fear will get stronger. The next time the NS and the US are paired, so the next time you're chased by a dog, that condition responding of fear will get stronger and stronger and stronger up to a certain point. And after that, it's as though your fear or your condition response has maxed out and continued pairings of the NS and the US, continued experiences of being chased by that dog will not cause that condition response to get any stronger. It started to, to level off. So during the acquisition, a more intense US will produce stronger and more rapid conditioning than a less intense US. So the stronger the unconditioned stimulus is, the more quickly you'll develop your condition response and the stronger your condition response will be. And this makes sense. So if you are listening to a song and you're involved in a minor fender bender, that song will produce less fear than if the song was paired with a major accident. So the fender bender would be a low intensity US, the major accident would be a high intensity US. So the higher intensity US of the major accident would lead to a stronger conditioned uh, response of fear. Um, take Pavlov's example. If you were to ring a bell and pair it with meat powder, you would get less salivation than if you were to ring a bell and pair it with a steak, which would be a higher intensity US. So the bell paired with the steak will produce more salivation than the bell if it had been paired with um, meat powder. So that, that makes sense, that's to be expected. But what's a little bit surprising is that a more intense NS will also result in stronger and more rapid conditioning than a less intense NS. So if you were to, again, take pop off experiment, if you were to ring uh, you know, a bell and pair it with meat powder, as opposed to ringing a loud gong paired with meat powder, the louder gong, the stronger NS would lead to more salivation than the gentle bell ringing paired with the, the meat powder. Taking the dog example, if you were chased by a chihuahua, so a low intensity NS, that would result in less fear than being chased by a larger dog, a more intense NS. So both the strength of the unconditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus affect the strength and the speed of developing that conditioned response. So once you have a classically conditioned condition response, how do you get rid of that response? And so to extinguish or get rid of a classically conditioned response, you have to be exposed to the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. So think about the purpose of a classically conditioned response. What happens is that the conditioned stimulus predicts the presence of the unconditioned stimulus. So you predict that when you see a spider, you will be bitten by a spider. And so when you see a spider, you feel fear. To get rid of that fear, you would have to be exposed to the CS, so exposed to the spider without being bitten by the spider. So you have learned that the spider predicts that I'll be bitten. Now you have to learn that I can be exposed to a spider, I can see that spider, and the experience of being bitten will not necessarily follow that. So how do you get rid of your phobia? You have to be exposed to the thing that you fear. So if you fear dogs because you think they will bite you, you have to go around dogs. You have to be exposed to the CS without the US. So go around dogs without being bitten. So most people think that, oh, I have a phobia, so I need to avoid the thing that I have a fear of. 
if you do this, you will never get rid of your phobia because you have to have the experience of going around a thing that you fear without having happen what you think will happen. So go around dogs without being bitten, go around dogs without being chased, um, take an airplane trip without there being a crash. You have to be exposed to the CS without the U.S. happening. But we know that when you extinguish classically conditioned response, extinction does not completely eliminate the effects of conditioning. So after you've been through extinction, you've been exposed to the CS without the U.S., that conditioned stimulus, the CS, goes back to being a neutral stimulus. But after extinction, when the CS goes back to being a neutral stimulus, we put that in this in quotes. And that shows that this is a CS that's been extinguished, it's gone back to being an NS, but we know that it's never truly neutral again. We never eliminate all the effects of learning. And so we know that by a few different things. The first way that we know that the NS never goes back to being truly neutral like it was before conditioning is that if that NS in quotes, so that neutral stimulus is again paired with the US, learning comes back very quickly. That condition response comes back very quickly. So if you had a fear of dogs because you had been chased by dogs, you extinguish that fear by being around dogs really without being chased. And so now dogs are no longer a condition stimulus. Um, it is now an NS. It's now NS in quotes because you've extinguished your fear of dogs. If that dog or that NS in quotes is again paired with being chased or chasing you. So if you are again chased by a dog, your condition responding of fear comes back at a high level. So think back to that acquisition chart we had where when the US of being chased and the NS of the dog were paired, that fear slowly increases. After extinction, if you are again chased by a dog, the fear level doesn't go back to that low level that it was when you first started learning the response. That fear comes back at a high level. So that shows us even though you extinguished your fear of the dog, it never totally went away. That dog never went completely back to being neutral because once the dog chases you again, your fear comes back at a high level. You don't have to learn to fear the dog all over again. So we know that that learning has never completely gone away. Another thing that lets us know that extinction does not totally get rid of your learning is spontaneous recovery. And this is a reappearance of a conditioned response to a CS following a period of rest after extinction. So this would be, you have a fear of dogs because you've been chased by dogs. You extinguish that fear by being exposed to dogs, being around dogs without being chased. Now the dogs have gone back to being neutral. You no longer have a fear of dogs. If you do not see dogs for a while, you're not around dogs for a while, so there's a period of rest after extinction, and then you see a dog again, that fear is likely to come back. So even though the dog has not chased you again after extinction, just the fact that you have not been around that dog for a while, have been exposed to dogs for a while, when you see a dog again after that period of rest, your fear is likely to come back. So it's spontaneously recovered, even though the NS and the US have not been paired again. So when this happens, the condition response, in this case fear, tends to be at a lower level. It doesn't come back as strong and it tends to go away pretty quickly, but you do have that temporary spontaneous recovery of a condition response that had been extinguished. So this leads us to believe that when you go through extinction, you're not unlearning your condition response. You're not unlearning to fear dogs. What you're learning is to inhibit your condition response. You're learning to control your responding to dogs. So what you're learning is, I had a fear of dogs, now I'm the dogs will not necessarily chase me, so I have to learn to inhibit or control that condition response when I see a dog. So this is supported by the idea of disinhibition, which is a sudden recovery of a response during an extinction procedure when a novel stimulus is introduced. So this is like, if you're going through an extinction procedure, and your response of fear is slowly decreasing because you're being exposed to that CS without the US, during that extinction procedure, if something interrupts it, so let's say there's a loud siren or there's something that uh, interrupts your extinction um, procedure, 
that novel stimulus can interrupt the procedure and your condition responding comes back. So it's almost as if a novel stimulus enters it and makes you forget the fact that you are inhibiting your response to that condition stimulus. So again, it's as though um, something interrupts that procedure and your responding comes back even though it had been decreasing because you were going through extinction. So as we said, the purpose of classical conditioning is for you to be able to predict your environment, for you to be able to look at stimuli in the environment and predict what is going to come next. This would not be very helpful if you only developed a condition response to one particular stimulus. So if you were bitten by a spider and you only develop a condition response of fear to that one particular spider, that's not very helpful to you. So we tend to generalize, meaning that we tend to have a condition response to other stimuli that are similar to the condition stimulus that we have developed a condition response to. So for example, if you are bitten by, let's say a Rottweiler, if you have stimulus generalization, you may develop a fear not only to Rottweilers, but to Doberman or to any other large black dog. So you have generalized your fear. You have that same fear to, to other stimuli that are similar to the condition stimulus that you developed a condition response to. Phobias can be conceptualized as overgeneralizations. So you have generalized your condition response too much. So for example, if you were bitten by a Rottweiler, you develop a fear not only to the Rottweiler, but to Doberman, but to any other dog, a medium-sized dog, a small dog. So you have the same fear response to a Chihuahua that you do to a Rottweiler. So you overgeneralize that fear. What comes to mind when I think about this is the fact that my mom has a fear of snakes. And it goes beyond just being a fear to being a phobia, because not only does she fear snakes if she's out working in the garden, she fears seeing snakes on TV. She cannot see photographs of snakes. She cannot look at pictures of snakes in books without having a fear response. So she's overgeneralized her fear of snakes to include you know, touching pictures, even drawings of snakes cause her fear. So it has you know, reached the level of being a phobia. So the opposite of stimulus generalization would be stimulus discrimination. This is where you have a tendency to respond to certain stimuli more than others. So you are able to discriminate between different stimuli. So for example, if you drink a Coke and you later get sick and you find that from then on you feel nauseous when you drink Cokes, but not when you drink a Pepsi, you are exhibiting stimulus discrimination. So you're able to discriminate between those two stimuli, even though they're similar. So you have a response to one and not the other, or you have a lower level of responding to one than the other. So maybe you feel extremely um, nauseous when you see a Coke, but only have a little bit of nausea when you see a Pepsi. So taking our dog example, you bitten by a Rottweiler, you have a fear of Rottweilers, but you don't have a fear of smaller dogs. So you're able to discriminate between different stimuli. If you have a generalized response, you can be taught to discriminate between different stimuli. Um, and so you do this through discrimination training. So take the example of Pavlov. If the dog has generalized their responding, so they salivate not only to bells, but to gongs and to whistles and to other similar, similar stimuli, you can teach that dog to discriminate between those stimuli by presenting the meat powder only when you ring the bell. So ring the bell, present the meat powder, the dog will learn to salivate to the bell. When you bang the gong or blow the whistle, you do not present the meat powder. So the dog will, um, will lose their responding to those stimuli. So you'll extinguish their responding to the gong and to the whistle and you will um, have them respond to, to the bell. So you teach them to discriminate between those similar stimuli. So while doing discrimination training with dogs, one of Pavlov's colleagues noticed something interesting. 
So during this experiment, he would show the dog a circle. So looking at our little graphic here on the left side with the S plus, this experimenter would show a dog a circle and when the dog was shown a circle, he would get meat, the meat powder, he would be given food. And then he would show the dog this sort of elliptical shape. And when the dog saw that shape, he was not given food. So circle, you're given food, the elliptical shape, you are not given food. Over time, the experimental would have those shapes get more similar. So if you go down, go down this graphic, you know, S plus starts clearly as a circle, S minus as an elliptical shape. Those two shapes got more and more similar. So as the shapes got more and more similar, the dog was not able to discriminate. The dog was not able to tell, does this shape mean that I will get food? Or does this shape mean that I will not be able to get food? So as long as he could discriminate between the two, he could tell what the shape meant was going to happen next, the dog died. But as the shapes got more and more similar and the dog could no longer discriminate, the dog started to show experimental neurosis. And experimental neurosis is an experimentally produced disorder in which animals exposed to unpredictable events develop neurotic-like symptoms. And neurotic-like symptoms are symptoms of anxiety. So the, the dog started to get agitated. The dog was on edge, the dog was nervous. And this happened because the situation was no longer predictable. The dog did not know what to expect. So the dog didn't know what does this stimulus mean is going to happen next. He couldn't predict what was going to happen based on the stimulus the dog was shown. So think about this with people in your lives. Do you have anybody where, you know, you can't read their cues, you can't look at them and tell, are they happy, are they upset? You know, based on their behavior, I don't know what to, to expect next from them. And, you know, those people can make you very much on edge, can make you uncomfortable because you never know what's what's coming. You never know how to read their signs they're giving you because, um, you know, they're they're unpredictable. There's no way to to determine what's going to happen next based on the signals they're giving you. So while doing these discrimination trials or training, uh, Pavlov noticed that certain dogs developed this experimental neurosis and other dogs didn't. So based on those observations, Pavlov, along with Hans Eisnick, developed a theory of personality. And this theory says that inherited differences in temperament interact with classical conditioning to produce certain patterns of behavior. So behavior is a result of your genetic temperament, your inborn temperament, and your classical conditioning experiences. So this theory of personality says that introverts, these are people who tend to be more to themselves, who find social interactions to be more draining, who feel energized um, being alone. So these type of people are highly reactive to external stimulation. So they tend to find a lot of you know, stimulation to be draining, to be irritating. These people condition easily. So they make associations between stimuli and their environment very easily and they develop condition responses easily. And they tend to develop anxiety type symptoms in reaction to stress. And so as an introvert, this makes sense to me. You know, I know that I condition easily because I'm constantly trying to make my environment more predictable. I you know, make associations between things I see so I can predict what's happening next so that I can feel comfortable in my environment so I'm not surprised, so I, I know what to expect. So in contrast, extroverts, these are people who are more outgoing, they tend to be energized by social interactions and they may find being alone to be sort of draining. These people are less reactive to external stimulation. So they, they do well with lots of stimulation from the environment. These people condition less easily. So they tend to, to draw associations between stimuli and their environment less easily. And they tend to develop physical type symptoms in reaction to stress. So rather than fe feeling anxious or feeling nervous in reaction to stress, they may develop muscle aches or develop stomach aches or more physical symptoms in reaction to, to stress in their environment. So think about your own personality. Does this hold true for you? And so again, Pavlov and Eisnick would say that your personality or your behavior is a result of sort of your inborn temperament as well as how you classically condition and how you react to, to stimuli in your environment.